Are we ready to rally? Thank you all for showing up. This is a good, good crowd, considering all the scares we got going. Welcome to the 2020 Cannabis Rally in the Rotunda. I want to say a couple thank yous to some folks. First of all, I want to say thank you to every legislator who dared to put their name on a cannabis bill this session. We have 10 of them. Thank you, John. 
John Mark, uh, over 50 co-sponsors of House Bill 136, have made a, a, a major move and a, a bold move, and we thank you for it. One thing about the medical, um, of course, we're for my right to decide. We want to see the prohibition end, but we're in an emergency with medical. We have 22 veterans a day committing suicide in America. In Kentucky, we have one veteran every three days that commits suicide. We've had these veterans from Vietnam say that when they come home from Vietnam, they've turned into alcoholics and cannabis helped them off that. Then the VA had them on every drug you could think of and cannabis helped them off that. He said, now when I wake up at three o'clock in the morning and I have these terrible nightmares and my brother's body parts are blowing up around me, he said, I can just go to my cupboard and take a couple draws off my pipe and go and get sleep, and then he gets up in the morning, he's just asking for safe access to help him with the terrible nightmares of war. If we stand up for anybody on medical marijuana, we ought to stand up for the veterans who went over and fought for our freedom to do what we're doing right now. I can't understand how a veteran can go and fight and experience the nightmares of war and come back and say, cannabis is helping me with these nightmares. Please help me. And these leadership senators are shaking their nose, thumbing their nose at our veterans and saying, no, that has got to stop and it's got to stop now. Veterans are suffering with PTSD and they're not the only ones. We have first responders, responders who would like to have safe access. We also have folks who have been coming in these hallways with their babies that have Gervais syndrome and cannabis oils help them. They've had to go to Colorado to get safe access. We've had people in wheelchairs, quadriplegics, in these hallways for seven years begging for safe access because he don't want to go blind with glaucoma. His doctor says it helps him if he uses cannabis and they still say no. It's got to stop. It has to stop. <laughs> medical marijuana, medical cannabis is an emergency right now because of the folks who desperately need it. They say they want research, research. 34 states have researched it already. 34 states have researched it. We paid 40 years to have research in Israel. The research is there. We have Senator Clark here today is going to be speaking. He calls it willful ignorance, and that's exactly what it is. All they have to do is Google cannabis and see that it's safe. It's better than alcohol. It's better than the FDA drugs. Cannabis is an emergency. We also have another situation, and that's the fact that we're locking up people for cannabis. And in Indiana, Illinois, I mean Ohio, Illinois, Michigan, you can go there and you're not a criminal. Here, if you consume cannabis, you're a criminal. That's got to stop, and it's got to stop now. One of the biggest things that really gets on me is they're so, so down on home grows, but it's okay to brew 100 gallons of your own booze every year. That's okay. We'll glamorize the bourbon trail. We'll take all the money off the bourbon trail, but damn you, don't you smoke any marijuana or you're going to jail. That's got to stop now. I'm not here now to bourbon. I'm not, if that's your thing, fine. I don't want bourbon. I don't want your pills. Cannabis does me just fine. Cannabis does me just fine with my arthritis, with my broken back, with my hips. It does not for my depression. It, and it's not going to kill me. It's never killed the first person. How many people has bourbon killed? But it's okay. That's got to stop. Drink your bourbon, glamorize it all you want, but leave us alone. Yeah. 
Abraham Lincoln said that prohibition makes criminals out of otherwise good people. And that's what's happening. We've got good people in this room today. And we've got a lot of people that were afraid to come because of the stigma. Maybe their boss will see them and fire them. Maybe they'll, their kids will be taken away because they come to this rally. That has to stop. It has to stop. You people are good people. You're good people. You don't deserve the stigma. You don't deserve to have to look for alternative medicines. Up until 1942, our, our physicians prescribed it successfully. Then we had this guy come out and put all the prohibition on the backs of our African Americans and Mexicans, and the doctors were forced to come up with alternative medicines. Now look what we have. Now look what we have. A bunch of addiction, people dying from opiates. But what's happening in the states that have regulated cannabis, there's a 24.8% reduction in opioid overdoses. There is a reduction in veteran suicide in states that have regulated cannabis. We have to end it. We have a couple other legislators here I want to introduce that were bold enough to, to come out with full adult use, adult responsible use. We don't call it recreational marijuana. They don't call it recreational bourbon. We're not going to let them call it recreational marijuana. That's a spin word. We need an adult, responsible use. I'm 21 and over. I'm a taxpayer. I'm a good person. I help people in my community. I am not a criminal. Leave me alone. First of all, I'm going to call up. He's retired. He brought in Senate Bill 80. Uh, that was the adult responsible use. Senator Dan Simon, where you at?
You have the power of the vote. We, we are absolutely convinced. And I think the last general election, last November, proved the point that this group and this organization and this issue controls 10% of the vote on a statewide basis. Period. We have a former governor. Remember that. Statewide, 10%. Now, what does 10% mean? These statewide elections are one of two and three percent swing between the two. So 10% is a killer if you're organized on a statewide basis. You go after the guy that doesn't agree with you on your issue. I'm going to talk about the power of the chair. You know, for those who don't know, I spent 40 years here as a legislator. In 40 years, I don't have a question of my integrity. 40 years I have uh, no family member with the job, no contracts with the state, no contracts with the city. We didn't do anything but take ourselves. And what that means is this. That means that I could just I could have done just any damn thing I wanted to do. No governor, nobody could call me up and say, you owe me. You always want to be careful when you get in office as to who you uh, what you take from the system. Because they will own it. We talk about Whitney Westerfield. Whitney's a good man, he's not a bad person at all. I think he's somewhat uneducated on this issue. He's the chairman of the judiciary. And right now, there are two words that are holding up this bill. Those two words are Whitney Westerfield. That's the two words. Let me explain the power of the chair to you if you don't know. Now, we feel and know that if the bill gets heard in committee that it will pass the committee. We feel and know that we have enough votes on the Senate floor to pass it. So there's one individual right now. We've got to be respectful here because he hasn't yet said no, but he hasn't heard the bill either. Okay. Here's the power of the chair. Chairman of any committee here sets the agenda for what's going to be heard in the committee hearings. And then if the bill is never on the agenda, it just never gets heard. That's the power of the chair. You need to understand that. So if you're from down around with me, see now again, if you want to be respectful, uh, we don't say anything derogatory or unkind about anybody. But we ought to be camping in his office right now. Now, back when I was chairman, by the way, I spent 14 years in leadership in the Senate. Back when I was chairman of the committee, I heard every bill. And I would say to that person, I, I would say, you know, I don't agree with your bill. Matter of fact, I'm a no, but we're going to hear the bill. That's democracy. You as a group to get your votes together, you get them together. Prohibition. I find it fascinating that this is exactly what it is. This is a rerun of the 1930s when we had to make a prohibition. We know that. And people were dying left and right back in the day. We were fighting over who was going to control the liquor. And people were dying because they got into rock gut whiskey. When's the last time you heard somebody die in a rock gut whiskey? It doesn't happen. Why? Because we legalized it, and you can now go downtown or in your neighborhood and buy a liquor store and buy a clean product. That's what this bill, medical marijuana, does allow you to have access to a clean product. So the next time I get cancer, I don't have to go to the street. Local pharmacy or my local cannabis store and get what I want down there. You know, uh, Dan mentioned uh, about money. I was on the center floor a while back and we were desperate. You know, the teachers were here and we needed this $30, 40000000000 billion dollar hole in the pension fund. They were talking taxes. They were actually talking about taxing Social Security. Granny might get upset with that. 
this plant. Yes! Yes! It's been around a long time. If it was really as awful and horrible and destructive as the other side says it is, don't you think we would already do it? Yes! So I just want to say this. I was with you in the beginning. I'll be with you in the end. Yes!
Yeah. Uh-huh. 
there very few. Pioneering just for a long time. We're gonna hate to see you come down there. We thank you for what you've done for us. And like like Dad said, that we do control 10% of this vote statewide. You guys need to understand the power that you really have. One thing I do understand how we have gotten totally sick of government. I understand it. I understand you just want to go home and say screw it all. But like Plato said, if we don't get involved in our government, we will be governed by fools. And we have got to get involved in our government. A couple facts I want you all to know. In Kentucky, we're in your number one, two, or three in exports and production of cannabis. We in this country, taxpayers, pay the University of Mississippi to grow marijuana that is supposed to be so bad that the government grows and gives to five patients 25 joints every, I mean 30 joints, 300 joints every 25 days. Since 1982, they're getting it. I'm a criminal if I do it. It's got to stop. There's some folks I want to, to bring up. Uh, Tom Rector is part of the My Right to Decide team. Tom helped lead up a group bus. We all went to Metro Council. And we got a LLEPO done, Laws Level Enforcement Policy Ordinance. I'm going to let Tom Rector come up and tell you what that means for Jefferson County and for Kentucky if you really want to get involved. Tom, come up and tell them what they got done. Every big city in Kentucky, 
Oldsboro, Ashland, Lexington, Bowling Green, Covington, Northern Kentucky, every decent sized city, there's 50 or 100,000 people, and you need to try and get the LLEPO passed there. That's how we get the minimum. You know, when Allison Brown said, go and get medical resolutions to support the medical bill a few years ago, I've been telling people this the whole time. You've got to go local first. You know, government is basically a local function, and the local government doesn't close. It's open all year round. Now, I wouldn't recommend going to Livermore, Kentucky, or Mumfordville, or some tiny town, and tell the sheriff there, hey, I think we ought to legalize pot, because a lot of people follow you home. You see what I'm saying? That's why I would recommend going to a decent sized city if you live close to one and try to get a similar thing that we got past the moon and past the day. That's how we build momentum to get the adult music. Yeah. Yeah.
time out, I want to introduce C.J. Carter. C.J. Carter's with Minorities for Medical Marijuana. C.J., where you at? I've been working on the NAACP and the ACLU because one of the things I found out is that our African-American neighbors are arrested four to six times more for cannabis possession than anybody else. That's got to stop now. Conviction will, will affect your child custody terminations, will keep you from public housing, will keep you from jobs, and our African American neighbors are arrested six times more in Jefferson County. It's got to stop. CJ, I've asked CJ to come and represent the community. We're working on the NAACP. We think if we get them involved in this, we're going to make some changes big time in Kentucky because they are affected. CJ, say a couple words for us, brother. Hello, my fellow Kentuckians. Say hello, my fellow Kentuckians. As Dan said, uh, my name is CJ Carter, and on Father's Day of 2018, I had the first seizure of my life. Um, two weeks after that, I had another seizure. After the fourth seizures, the doctors, they diagnosed me with tumor mode epilepsy. So basically, since the summer of 2018, I've had more than enough. And I've had my fair share of seizures. However, having the right to decide and manage my own health care, I have found a medication that works for me. And of course, that medication is cannabis. Interestingly enough, uh, medical practitioners have known about the use of cannabis tincture to relieve seizure effects for centuries. The actual first mention of the use of cannabis was in 1464. The first formal use actually happened in 1838 in Great Britain. So basically it appears that a few decades of prohibition has sufficed to obliterate all the knowledge associated with the therapeutic use of cannabis. Which is why I'm a firm believer in the wellness theory. Of course, the wellness theory, it holds that cannabis is and has always been since ancient times a medicine. Yeah. Cannabis is not an intoxicant. Not an intoxicant. The use responsibly, of course, cannabis is about being well. It's not about being high. So that brings me here today. My story and my life's journey has led me to be a cannabis advocate, a cannabis entrepreneur, as well as a cannabis activist. I'm currently the Kentucky chapter president of Minorities for Medical Marijuana, which is a national nonprofit working diligently in 25 states. In a general sense, our mission is focused on providing advocacy, outreach, research, and training as it relates to the business, social reform, public policy, and health and wellness of the cannabis industry. Right now, we're currently working with legislators here in Kentucky to actually amend the current proposed legislation in order to make a fair and equitable cannabis space right here in Kentucky. Because let's face it, the cannabis laws are draconian and archaic at best. And they do a lot more harm than they do good. Clear case in point is a very specific war on a very specific community and culture. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the war on drugs. Or I should say, the soon to be 50 year old war on drugs. Which, of course, is drug prohibition backed by military aid and military intervention. And, of course, it has cost over $1 trillion. I'm not sure if you know, but that's 1,000 billions, or 1 million times a million. That's a lot of money. And what has it accomplished? Yeah, of course, it's hard to say, but I can tell you one thing for sure. It has disproportionately arrested in terms of the prison sentences for individuals who look just like me. As it relates to cannabis, 
there have been millions of national arrests, and in those arrests there is a clear racial disparity between the arrests and convictions for individuals and races within this country. Hence, my community has been adversely affected by prohibition, its heavy law enforcement approach, and the mass incarceration of results. You know, this makes me ask the question, how many lives have been destroyed by the intrusion of the justice system in a relatively harmless pastime that 90% of Kentuckians feel is no harm? Now, this all begs the question, what is Kentucky truly capable of? And why is cannabis prohibition still in existence here in Kentucky? And how do we make change happen? You know, change doesn't happen by chance. Change happens by continuous collective action. Change happens by having a robust grassroots organization change that's followed by contentious collective action. Change happens by connecting with people profound way that resonates with the emotional. You know, changing hearts and minds and not just changing public policy. Change happens because of relentless advocacy by vast networks of individuals and organizations who campaign in the face of insurmountable obstacles against entrenched powerful components. You know, this is our current reality. And it's of the utmost importance that this rally and that this movement be a real economic engine in terms of promoting change here in the state of Kentucky. Yeah. So since this is our reality, we have to be uncompromising in the face of injustice. We have to be courageous in the face of adversity. We have to be intrepid in the pursuit of opportunity because we know without a shadow of a doubt that ignorance is a lot more dangerous than intoxication. Yeah. And with that being said, the marathon continues. Thank you, CJ. Um, for a uh, time, almost seven years, I was the veterans coordinator for Kentuckians for medicinal marijuana. And I met a fella who's been working at this for a long time, including the, uh, the veterans of Kentucky. He's not afraid to stand up. He's not afraid to uh, shout them down if they need to be. He brings the truth. He's been, he's been working these halls for a long time, representing these veterans. And I've asked him to come and speak a couple of words. Uh, Brent Goff, would you please come up and say a couple of words? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
advice to give you in the hospital?
got to have that conversation with our federal delegation. We, it, it needs to start here, just like we did on the hemp side many years ago. I was at the table, Senator Paul and others, uh, and, and, and to even get where we are. There's no excuse for this policy uh, stalemate, if you will. There's no excuse for this. And you sit in an office like I have for 20 years and you see uh, children, cancer patients, chronic pain, opioid addicted individuals crying out for relief or veterans and other populations that we should be catering to at every level. Yeah. Yeah.
his cause. And it was a good example. It was a good example of the mission that we set out. Now, he passed away in January 2012. It was a big shot to me. It was a blow. It was a blow to the freedom fighters. You guys are way back with you. Shortly after he died, it seemed to me like in just a couple of months, him started moving. The, their fathers in Washington, the great fathers, the, the authoritarian Congress started lit, loosening a few hooks, getting us a little rope. It started moving. And it was good. And I thought to myself, were they waiting until Gabriel died or what? But as quick as I thought that, I thought, well, no, I'm surprised Gabriel would not be not be surprised. I'm certain that they would not be surprised that it happened that way. People said, what took you so long? Well, what has changed since then? It's been eight years. What's changed since they, then? Not much that I see. Yeah, I'm still, I guess we're getting us a little more rope, a few more seats, a few more places. But I don't see much more change since then. Except one thing I see has changed a lot. They would not he wouldn't be surprised with his chance to live. And that's the goal. That's the people that want cannabis legalized. worked 
fault crime for a long time was that it allowed for the movement of extracts or concentrates from one processor to another. So this was something that uh, we have been pushing for for a while. Uh, the Ag Department said can't move process, uh, concentrates from one processor to another, uh, even if it's the same company. Even if you're a company with two different locations and you're moving it from one lab to your manufacturing facility, or you want to sell some extracts to a small business to, to make a product that they already make, no can be. So this year we were able to change that because it was an emergency bill that got signed and went through and uh, should have taken effect pretty quickly after that. Another really important bill that we had this year was House Concurrent Resolution 57. This was sponsored by Representative Richard Heath out of Western Kentucky and Representative Mark Hart, who's from Cynthia. Um, this is another thing that the hemp industry has been pushing for for a long time. We've been asking for legislators and regulators to raise that THC limit to 1%. What that does for us, it gives our farmers some wiggle room. You know, we've had farmers that have had hemp that, you know, as you know, the definition is 0.3% THC. So anything above 0.3% is considered marijuana, which is kind of absurd when you think about the quality of 1% THC marijuana. But it's important for hemp farmers because we're on the other side of that, that, um, that threshold. So we've been asking for 1%. We've seen some crop destructions. We've seen them in Kentucky. We've seen them in other states. It's starting to become a thing. Um, so House Concurrent Resolution would actually ask federal government to raise the THC limit to 1%. So we kind of uh, address them to the point that, you know, it's something that the feds have to do. The state, the state is not going to, you know, try to supersede the federal government's power there. Uh, so, so we're asking the federal government to do, we're asking Congress to do this. Um, that resolution made it through the House, but it landed in the Senate and Ag Committee, and it hasn't really gone anywhere. So it passed the House 91 so with overwhelming support. We have overwhelming support uh, from the hemp industry, basically from anybody that, that has anything to do with hemp whatsoever. It's kind of a no-brainer, um, but I understand there's a lot of important things that, that go on in the Senate Act Committee, and, um, you know, I have time for those too. So another uh, bill that was filed this year uh, was House Bill 593, which I believe Senator Webb covered, so I won't go too far into that. Um, but it is something that we do need in, in, in the hemp industry, and I'll explain why. Right now, we really we have a lot of uh, sort of fly-by-night hemp companies that are just popping in. They're either getting grants here or investors there, and they spend a bunch of money, and they market their name really well, and then they disappear right around harvest time. And the farmers are left holding the bag, and the products that are coming out of that are junk, and, and they're selling products that may or may not even have CBD in it. So we know CBD is the big craze, but if it says a thousand milligrams, there ought to be a thousand milligrams in the bottle. And that is something that it's been a little bit of a black eye on the hemp industry because we haven't been able to get ahead of that in the way in the form of industry standards that have really taken off. Um, so this is this is really the, the state government, the General Assembly's. Uh, way of saying, you know, you've got to label it right, you've got to make sure that you have an address on there and a zip code and a way for people to contact you. Because we've had people selling CBD out there that don't even have a phone number or a website. They call us and then they yell at us and we're like, no, no, you know, our number's on everything. So, um, so it's very important. I hope that that bill uh, will continue and from what I hear, I got an update from Representative Grace this morning. Um, and it should be posted for a health and family services committee tomorrow. Um, it just kind of slowed down for a little bit, but it's looking, looking like we're going to get a hearing. Uh, the last bill for the 
said that hemp is marijuana sober cousin. And I think that's an okay description, but I also, personally, have, to me, hemp is, is uh, marijuana's dietitian. Hemp is the one saying, you gotta eat your hemp seeds, and you gotta get your fiber, and don't forget that protein. Let's get you some fresh acids, amino acids, all this good stuff that we need for good brain health and good cardiovascular function. And I've always said that hemp is a way for us to get to a point where maybe our health and our diet is so good that we don't even have to use medical marijuana. I would love to get the American diet to the point where diabetes isn't a thing anymore. And, and these, these, you know, chronic illnesses, chronic pain, a lot of these things are managed by the food that we eat. And a lot of people who have the best results with cannabis that I found, and I'm sure a lot of you all have found, are the ones who change their diet as well. So, um, so I, I think I will wrap things up, but, but I just kind of want to end with, um, you know, judging by how kind of panicky everybody is um, about smokable flour and the possibility that hemp flour might be in someone's car or They're so scared of it, and I don't think that most people are. I think it's just kind of a handful of people in the legislature that are really scared. Um, but they've always said that hemp was just the camel's nose under the tent for marijuana. And I'm beginning to think that the best thing that the hemp industry can do is to support these cannabis bills this year.